is Dr. Peter Flapchan. I'm the director of the George Mason's Observatory. Uh, we have a wonderful guest tonight. We're looking forward to her talk. Um, to follow us and, and see more events like these in the future, please uh, visit our website at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. You can follow us on Twitter at GMU Observatory. And if you have any questions or requests for information, you can reach out to us via email at gmuobservatory at gmail.com. Uh, these events are free on alternating um, Thursdays. Um, uh, whoops, excuse me. And uh, they're roughly uh, talks, uh, public talks appropriate for all ages of 30 to 60 minutes, uh, followed by guided telescope tours of, uh, of the night sky. Now tonight, unfortunately, the humidity is a little high. Uh, if it does manage to stay a little bit low, uh, we will certainly um, open the telescope and give everyone a virtual night sky view of the night sky. But unfortunately at the moment, it looks like the humidity won't cooperate here in Fairfax, Virginia. If you're joining us from afar, uh, welcome. Uh, and we will have a Q&A after tonight's talk. Um, if you have questions during the talk, I ask that you post those questions in the chat. We'd also like to hear from you about interest in future topics, how you found out about this talk. And so I'll be posting a link to a survey uh, in the chat um, after uh, we finish with introductions. We certainly will look forward to welcoming everyone back in the future in person. We hope you are all safe and staying healthy. Um, and this is just a photo showing what some of our public nights look like in person. Our next talk will be November 5th and our speaker will be Dr. Luisa Rabul uh, from Caltech. Uh, here's a picture of our observatory located atop Research Hall of the Fairfax George Mason campus. Uh, with an arrow there pointing to where the control room for the observatory is. And there you can see the classic dome uh, on top of the building and some pictures uh, taken here in the suburbs of DC uh, with our 0.8 meter uh, uh, telescope that we'll be showing you virtually later tonight. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter called The Moon. Uh, please sign up, it's free. It's, it's, uh, you can sign up at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. Uh, and we also have a philanthropic organization in order to continue to inspire excellence in astronomy as well as engage the greater DC area community about astronomy. Uh, we do ask for your help. We have a distinguished group of philanthropists, leaders, and educators in the field of ast astronomical science, uh, and your, any donations are tax deductible. Uh, so we have different support levels ranging from $50 a year for individual memberships up to Big Bang members. And we would like to thank our current patrons, including uh, New Nova Cluster and STAR members. And we have a large team of students um, that uh, we have over a thousand people uh, visiting our observatory per year, or probably almost a thousand per semester in some semesters. Uh, and I'm the director. We have Dr. Rob Parks, who's our new deputy director. We have with us tonight uh, Justin Wittrock and William Masco, who are observatory graduate teaching assistants. They will be um, uh, assisting and giving your guided tour tonight virtually of our telescope. We also have a student club, Friends of the Observatory, that's uh, free. And our, our president is Brandon Iverson. So if you're a student here at Mason, I encourage you to find them on Mason 360 and participate in their events. We've got, uh, I believe, a pumpkin carving contest coming up. And, uh, we're currently having a, a logo design contest uh, that the students are working on and, and, and the students are, are going to get t-shirts with those logos. Uh, we also have student tour guides, uh, Ryan, Patrick, Owen, Ashley, Victor, Brandon, and Andrew. Um, Ashley, Owen, and Patrick are, are here tonight. Uh, so at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jesse Christensen from Caltech. Um, she and I were colleagues when I was back at Caltech a number of years ago before I left. Uh, and uh, her research is uh, very near and dear to my heart on, on exoplanet science. And we're excited to have Dr. Christensen here to present to us tonight. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Christensen. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, let me get my screen going. This will stop you from sharing, Peter. Uh, 
Okay, let's get this started. Hi, everybody. Oh, I wish that I was there and I could be giving this talk in person. Uh, but the exciting thing about the pandemic, the silver lining is that I get to give talks all over the world. Um, so this is really exciting. And thank you, Peter, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. So Peter alluded a little bit to what I work on and what he works on, which is exoplanets. So exoplanets are planets that we found orbiting other stars. So our solar system has eight planets in it. We can debate about Pluto in the question and answer afterwards. Uh, but so, but in the universe, there are many, many, many more planets and we've just started to scratch the surface. So I wanted to walk you through the history of thinking about and searching for exoplanets and some of the wild and weird stuff that we found. Okay, if I was there in person, I'd ask for a show of hands if anybody recognizes this planet. So just look at it for a second, cogitate on the title of the talk and think about this planet. Maybe this would help. All right, so this is in fact the planet Vulcan. This is Spock's homeworld from Star Trek and that's Enterprise, of course. Uh, so Vulcan in the Star Trek mythology, everything in Star Trek is very deep, has many names. Uh, it's also known as Vulcanus A2, Navasa 2 or 40 Eridani A2. I have to move my little zoom window so I can see. So this is a big planet in the Star Trek in the Star Trek universe. This is Spock's homeworld. Now, in my day job, I think about planets in real life, but a lot of what I do is inspired by the imaginings of people who've come thousands of years before me. So two and a half thousand years ago, the Greek philosophers were talking about this idea of another earth. They were wondering, was there just one earth or were there many earths? And they were doing this as basically a thought exercise. They, they weren't telescopes yet, they couldn't search for them. But the Greek philosophers really disliked tossing ideas around. And one of the ideas they tossed back and forth was this idea, maybe, maybe that there's more than one earth. Uh, Plato and Aristotle actually argued that there wasn't, that there was only one earth and there could only be one earth, philosophically. The next thing we see in the, is that we start to see the planets in our solar system appear in fictional works, appear in literature. So we have Dante's Paradise, which explores this idea of these concentric circles around the Earth that have the planets in them. Now, before Galileo came along and we had this idea of this Copernican system, before Copernicus came along, uh, we thought that you know planets were in these concentric circles around us and we see this appear in these fictional stories. So we start to see these planets appear in stories thousands of years ago. So let's fast forward a little bit to the Renaissance. It's a big time for art and math and science and literature uh, in the Western world. Uh, and there's this quote that I'm gonna read by this Italian mathematician, Giordano Bruno, which says, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their stars in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our solar system. This was before we knew about Neptune and then Pluto and then demoted Pluto again. That's why it's seven. So this guy, Giordano Bruno doesn't just cogitate on this idea that actually the universe is full of stars and planets, he also hits on one of the big problems, which is that stars are really, really, really big and planets are really, really, really small and faint, comparatively speaking. So even though we have this idea, they're really hard to find. Then as we go through this, the, the literature, what's happening in parallel to the science, we see that the moon appears. The moon starts to be the focal point of fiction and, and science fiction starts to become a thing. Uh, and so we have, all this, we have the moon appear in many works of literature. Then we move on and Mars becomes this subject of study and wonder, the canals and all of the things that are happening. So Mars starts to appear in the public imagination as this place, or this fictional place. In science, we move along and in 1952, so only 70 years ago, Otto Struve, an astronomer, suggest an idea how we might be able to, to find these planets, to see these planets around their stars by observing how fast they wobbled if planets orbiting them were pulling them around with their gravity. Our sun wobbles in the middle of our solar system because of Jupiter and Otto thought, hey, if we look at other stars and look at their wobbles, we might be able to see what they do. And that's what Peter, who introduced me, does a lot of. He works on the radial velocity method, which is what we call it. So it comes up with this idea. And then for the next 40 years, this paper that he writes is cited less than 10 times. No one really thinks it's a good idea because to, to really do this, you would need to have a really big planet right next to a star orbiting its star in just a few days. And no one had any idea that that could work. How would that work? How would you form a Jupiter sized planet and then park it right next to the star? 
So the idea was great, but it kind of sat on the shelf for a while because nobody really thought those kinds of planets would exist. In the meantime, we start to see actual exoplanets appear in the public culture. So we have the first exoplanet appear in a movie, and then we have the first exoplanet appear on TV. And Doctor Who was actually the first TV show to show exoplanets, to show these fictional worlds, planets around other stars. And finally, in the 90s, so only 25 years ago, the first planet was finally found orbiting a star just like the sun using the method that Otto Struve had come up with. So it's actually quite funny if you look at the citation history of his paper, as I said, it just languishes. No one cites it for 40 years. And then all of a sudden it skyrockets and it's now very highly cited because this method that he proposed actually works. And now in 2020, we have found over 4,000 planets around other stars. Now in my day job, what I do is I collect planets for NASA. So this is NASA's exoplanet archive, how NASA keeps track of all of the planets that we've found where they are, what their properties are, everything we know about them. And so every day I'm going through the literature and I'm finding planets to put in the archive, thumbs upping and thumbs downing. Yes, that looks good. No, that doesn't look good. This was one I put in a couple of years ago. So what you have here on the screen is a whole list of names for this star. Astronomers are given far too much leeway to just rename stars whenever they want. So these are multiple different times that this star has been named by different people. But anyway, if you look very closely, one of them is 40 Eridani. So this is a constellation Eridanus, real constellation. Uh, and this is a star numbered number 40. Now this isn't the first time I've said 40 Eridani in this talk. 40 Eridani is a triple star system in real life. Uh, it has star A, which is this bright K star here. And then there's a M dwarf binary nearby, uh, B and Z. Now, 40 Eridani A, as I mentioned before, is the star that Vulcan orbits. So this is the star that Spock's homeworld is around. It's a real star, and we really found a planet around it. Now, the planet that we found around 40 Eridani, I will admit, is not really much like Vulcan. Uh, it's not, it's very, very likely not habitable. It's too hot. And in fact, most of the planets that we found, most of those 4,000 we found are too hot. I'll talk about some that aren't. Um, but so far, just the way our techniques are sensitive, we're still sensitive to those very close in planets like Otto Struve was predicting. But we have actually found a planet orbiting a star that uh, is Spock's homeworld. One of the things we found is that stars, if they host one planet, typically host more planets. So it may yet be that Spock's homeworld is orbiting 40 Eridani A, and we just haven't found it yet. We have found the, a, a different planet in the same system. Uh, so this is where we segue into all of the cool, all of the cool planets that we found. This is Kepler 62F. I apologize right up front for the names of the exoplanets, right? They're bad. I don't know why astronomers get to name things. We have no imagination. They all have rubbish names. Kepler 62F was named after Kepler, the survey, the NASA satellite that found it. Uh, 62 means it was the 62nd confirmed planet system found by Kepler. And F means it's the fifth planet from the star. So we call the first one B because the star is A, C, D, E, F. So Kepler 62F the fifth planet found in the 67, 62nd system found by Kepler. Kepler 62F is the closest thing to Vulcan, to the true parameters of Vulcan in the actual Star Trek that I can find. So this is as close as we get right now, Kepler 62F. So that exercise that I just went through of finding that 40 Eridani A was a real star and had a planet around it, just like in Star Trek, led me to this exercise. I went through the Star Trek online Wikipedia, essentially, which lists all of the stars and all of the planets that have been visited in Star Trek. I will caveat for all of the true Star Trek nerds out there, this has not been updated for lower decks. So there are 938 planets in the Star Trek Encyclopedia online, Memory Alpha. Uh, and of those, 51 have real star names. So names that I could actually work out what real star in our universe they were talking about. What that means is more than 850 have made up names that were impossible to map onto real things. But in 51 cases, it's a real star. So I put those 51 stars into the NASA Exoplanet Archive to see what we got. Seven of those real stars in our universe have been found to host planets. It's a pretty good hit rate actually. Uh, and one in particular I wanna talk about this is Tau Ceti. So Tau Ceti is a four planet system that we have discovered. 
It's in the constellation Cetus. So it's actually bright enough that it's one of the ones with the Greek letters. So it's here in the constellation Cetus. Uh, and it, we've found that it has four planets around it. Why is that super cool? Because the Tau Ceti in the Star Trek universe also has four planets around it. They didn't just get the star right, they got the number of planets right. Uh, so they're doing pretty well. It's not the only case of a real prognostication that we're going to see in terms of science fiction to real science. So the real Tau Ceti is pretty interesting, actually. So what I'm showing on the top is the star Tau Ceti and then the planets that orbit Tau Ceti. So in this figure, the planets are relative in size to each other, but not to the star. They're actually much smaller than this compared to the star, but they've been blown up so we can see them. And then on the bottom, what I'm showing is our inner solar system. So here's our sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. This green region here is what we call the habitable zone. So the habitable zone is where we think if you took Earth, a rocky planet with an atmosphere and liquid water, and put it in this green area around another star, it would still be habitable. That's all the habitable zone means. It's habitable for an Earth-like planet. And if you look at Tau Ceti, you can see that the, the planets of Tau Ceti are actually significantly bigger than the planets of, in the rocky planets of our solar system. So these are more like, we call them super Earths or sub-Neptunes. We're actually not sure typically what they are yet. It's a mystery. I love mysteries. We keep finding all these planets that we don't have a, a, any, any similar ones in our solar system. But the thing about Tau Ceti is there's two planets on either side of the habitable zone. You've got one just a bit too hot and one just a bit too cold. Uh, so that's really exciting because one of the things, ultimately, I won't lie, that we're interested in is looking for life. We want to know if there's anything else out there in our galaxy that's alive. Even better, if it could communicate with us, that would be amazing. Uh, so Tau Ceti uh, is one of these examples of planets really close to the habitable zone. Like if you tweak the conditions just a little bit, maybe, maybe one of these things is habitable. But you do have to tweak a bit. So I'm going to throw in the quote, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. So if these planets are inhabited by something, it's not something that would be able to survive on Earth and vice versa, because it's not quite in the habitable zone. But Tau Ceti, they called it. So it's, it's the right star and it's the right number of planets. Okay, so we're going to jump genres now just a little bit. So I asked the organizers of this talk to canvas the audience for what their favorite planets were. Vulcan was one of them, and we're going to hit a whole bunch. I'm a Whovian, I'm a big Whovian, so I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes talking about the planets of the Hooniverse. Just one, actually. But anyway, here's a breakdown without any labels. If you had a box that could take you anywhere in space and time, where would you spend most of your time? Could you answer Earth? Because that's where Doctor Who spends most of his time, or her time, with the new Doctor Who, which is awesome, by the way. Okay. Some of those are budget constraints on behalf of the BBC. But honestly, I think if I had a box that could go anywhere in space and time, I wouldn't spend most of my time on Earth. The next most common place that Doctor Who travels in her box are Earth-like planets. And by Earth-like, I mean they put an orange filter over a lens or they went into a cave, right? So it's not, it's not truly not Earth-like. It's pretty Earth-like. <clears throat> the next one I called Earth-ish. Now there's like enough that's different that, you know, the TARDIS needs to protect them in some way by extending some bubble or shield or magnetic thing. Uh, but honestly, it's a very small fraction of the time they're, any, they're even somewhere as imaginative as that. A lot of the times they go somewhere uninhabitable uh, and that's most of the exoplanets we found actually fall in this little yellow wedge here. Um, sometimes they just go to space, like they're on a spaceship out in the middle of nowhere. And sometimes they're on something really strange, like, you know, a debris ring in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so this is where, this is a breakdown, and I'm going to thank uh, my colleague JJ Eldridge here for their contribution. This is a breakdown of all of the different places that Doctor Who goes in her box. Now, when I ask Doctor Who fans what their favourite Doctor Who planet is, they always say Midnight. So Midnight is a famous David Tennant episode where they're, it's basically a bottle episode and they're on this crystalline planet. So it's a sightseeing episode. They're literally just there to look at pretty things uh, because it's a crystalline planet. Now, what I'm showing here is a picture of 55 Cancri E. Now, 55 Cancri E is a carbon rich planet that we found, which is so compressed. It's so small, so, so compressed that we think the inside of this planet is diamonds. Uh, and it's not the only one we found where we think the inside of the planet is diamonds. Uh, 
but this is as close as I can get to midnight. It's, it's crystalline on the inside. There aren't crystalline spires on the outside. The outside is molten because it's so close to its star, but that's one of the things that creates this pressure. Diamond planet. Okay, so I mentioned Kepler before. Let me just stop for one minute and tell you about Kepler because it's, you know, the love of my life. So Kepler was a NASA mission that was launched in 2009. It's a one meter telescope that, orbit, that uh, observed a field of sky for four years. And in that patch of sky, it found over 2000 planets. The main goal of Kepler was to determine how common Earth-like planets are to really resolve this question, this two and a half thousand year old question from the Greeks. Uh, how common is Earth? Is Earth alone or is it plentiful? Are there many of them? And I'm excited to share that, you know, one of the latest results out of Kepler is that something like 10 to 50% of stars like the sun have a planet like Earth in the habitable zone, have a rocky planet that's the right temperature for liquid water. Now, what that means is that our galaxy has something like 100 billion stars. And let's say 10 billion of those are G stars like our sun. That means there's something like one to five billion Earth-like planets in the galaxy, just in our galaxy, billions billions of Earth-like planets. And we couldn't say that 10 years ago. That's so exciting to be able to just say, we know that there are billions of planets like the Earth in our galaxy. Yay. Anyway, what we haven't found yet is an exact Earth twin. So here's some of the progress we've made towards that. So this one up here is an Earth-sized planet going around a star like the Sun. So in this figure, again, the planets are all scaled relative to each other in terms of size. And the stars are all scaled to each other relative with size and color, but the planets and the stars aren't scaled next to each other. So in this case, the planets aren't bigger than the stars. They're much smaller, but I've blown them up for ease. So we found small planets that are way too hot. We found big planets that are just the right temperature. We found little planets that are the right temperature, but are around really small stars. And that leaves us questioning a bit because the radiation profile of the energy that these really small stars puts out looks pretty different from the radiation profile that our sun puts out. Uh, so that could be bad. Um, I'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then finally, we found something that was a little bit bigger than the Earth and a little bit uh, near, around a star like the sun, a star that's pretty close to the sun. But there's still a mystery about this one. We'll get to that. Just leaving a little bit of suspense. Okay, so... One of, the pe one of the people who responded to the call for naming favorite planets said Mustafar. So this is the lava world from Star Wars where Anakin and Obi-Wan have their big final battle uh, at the end of the prequel trilogy. Um, and it's a lava world. The whole planet is lava. The whole planet is volcanoes. And we've actually found one of those. Um, so 55 Cancri E, which I said before, is one of these lava worlds. And this is Kepler 10c, which is another one of these worlds, which is a rock that is so close to its star that it's literally heated up to thousands of degrees. What happens to rock when you heat it up to thousands of degrees? Well, we see that here on Earth, uh, that you get lava. These are lava worlds. So we've actually found things like Mustafa. I say maybe because there aren't, we don't know that there are Jedi on them. We haven't got the spectrograph to find the lightsabers yet, but maybe. I can't say there aren't Jedi. That's what I'm going to say. Okay. This is Kepler 22b. So this was the too big planet that was the right temperature from the, uh, from the first slide. So Kepler 22b, it's really big. It's one of these super Earths or mini Neptunes that I said we don't really know what they're made of. But if we look at the bulk density, the average density of Kepler 22b, yeah, it's the density of water. So this could be something that we don't have in our system, which is just a pure water world, big blob of water, some kind of rock in the middle, maybe some atmosphere, but largely an ocean world. And we've imagined those before, uh, not very well if the critical acclaim can be taken into account, but we have seen water worlds before. And in fact, uh, one of the first one of these that we found, GJ1214b, again, I'm sorry about the names. This one actually has a good nickname. We called it Kevin after Kevin Costner because it was the first water world we found. Okay, so this is coming back to this planet. This is the small planet that's rocky around a planet, around a star that's very small. It's a very, a small red star called an M dwarf. Now the problem with M dwarfs is they put out too much high energy radiation. They put out too much of their radiation as UV rays and X-rays. 
Now that's bad for us. So, you know, anybody who's gone outside and gotten a sunburn or had to put on one of those lead aprons when they got an x-ray, it's because that's because UV and x-rays is bad for you. So there's some danger that these M dwarfs, these cool red stars will completely sterilize any rocks that are orbiting them. But maybe something else could survive around an M dwarf. So there is a planet called Krypton in the science fiction literature. You might've heard of it. It's where Superman's from. Superman is from a rocky planet around an M dwarf, an M star. And that's where he gets his powers from because because you know the profile there, he's fine. Um, but you come here and the radiation profile of our sun is so different that here he has superpowers. So you just have to imagine if we went to something like this, Kepler 186F, would we have superpowers or would we just, you know, get sunburned to a crisp? Who knows? It's fun to think about though. So we have found planets like Krypton. All right, this is the mystery one that I mentioned. This is Kepler 452b. So it's, a, it's about one and a half times the size of the earth in radius which means it's, oh, it's right on the edge of where we think something is rocky. It might be so big that it's gotten big enough that it started to collect a very big atmosphere like Uranus and Neptune, which means that the pressure at the bottom of the atmosphere would crush, you know, like Venus has this very crushy atmosphere. It, you know, if we went there, we might just get splattered by the atmosphere being so thick. But it could just be rocky and have a thin atmosphere. So we still need to find out. And it's orbiting a star like the sun, so that's good. This is currently the best prospect we have for an Earth twin. But unfortunately, it might not be there. If you look really closely at the data, there's a lot of noise. So there's a lot of times when the spacecraft is kind of doing its own thing. When you spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a spacecraft, what you're really building is a very expensive thermometer. Every time the temperature changes on a spacecraft or on any telescope that's trying to observe, the amount of light that falls on your camera changes. This happens a lot with Kepler even though we put it in as stable an environment we could, it's still changing its temperature. Uh, and the sorts of glitches that these temperature changes introduce to the data look very similar to the sort of glitches we see when we see Kepler 452. So it's kind of borderline. Our very best prospect of an Earth twin is probably a coin flip. It's probably about 50-50 that it's real. But that's as close as we've gotten so far. And what I, and someone on the someone who got canvas for their favorite planet asked for Caprica. Of course, in Battlestar Galactica, Caprica is like an exact Earth paradise, right? It's just a rocky planet with blue skies and breathable atmosphere around a lovely star. Uh, so we have not found Caprica yet because we haven't really found an Earth twin. Not yet, sorry. But Kepler did find an incredibly dizzying array of things. And towards the end, I'll tell you a little bit more about them. So it wasn't a total failure because it didn't find an Earth twin. Uh, but we were, we were a little disappointed, I'll admit. Okay. Again, if I was there, I would say, I would ask the audience who recognizes this one. This is another famous classic sci-fi. This is Star Wars. Uh, this is the first one, not the prequel trilogy. This is A New, uh, a New Hope. Uh, and what this is, is Tatooine. This is the planet Tatooine. And Luke is watching this sunset, this you know beautiful binary star sunset. There's two suns, one's red, one's yellow. And we've actually found planets orbiting binary stars. Uh, we now have almost a dozen planets orbiting binary star systems. Uh, and this one in particular I like because he even got the colors right. Like this is George Lucas in the 70s before we'd found any planets at all. And he's just out there like, oh, I think they'll be around two stars. Yeah, let's do that. That'll look great on the film. Not only did he get the number of stars right, he got the colors right too. He didn't get the sizes right because red stars are typically smaller than yellow stars, but you know, I'll give him a little bit of artistic license. He got really close. Uh, so we've, as I said, we've now found like a dozen of these planets orbiting binary star systems. So we found Tatooine. We get a, we get a check in that column. We get that one. This one, someone mentioned Vormir. So Vormir is from the Marvel universe. Uh, anybody who's familiar with that franchise probably remembers the scene. It's where the soul stone is. It's where the red skull is there. Spoilers, red skull is there, by the way, um, for a, an old movie at this point. Uh, and Vormir is referred to, I'm going to quote directly because it's kind of cool sounding, a remote barren planet at the very center of celestial existence. It's pretty cool. So the closest I could get, so our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. And we're about 30,000 light years from the middle. All the planets I've been talking about so far are actually pretty close to us within a few thousand light years. 
but there's one technique which is sensitive toward, for planets towards the center of the galaxy. That's called microlensing. Microlensing relies on, on relativity, on the fact that things with mass bend space time. So if you have a planet and a star go in front of a background star, the light from the background star gets magnified. It's like the, it's like the planet and the star are acting like a magnifying glass on the background star. Now, what that means is we have been able to find planets towards the center of the galaxy. It's sensitive towards the center of the galaxy because that's the densest screen of stars that we have. And you need lots of background stars just for the statistics of having them line up just right. So we look towards the center of the galaxy to find microlensing planets. So this is, oh, I'm not even going to try and pretend to remember its name. Microlensing planets always have terrible names. I think it's OGLE hyphen 2015 hyphen BLG hyphen 0179 LB. One or two of those numbers might be wrong, but that's the gist of it. It's just a huge alphabet string, and I'm sorry. But anyway, this planet is a very remote, barren planet, very distant from its star, very far away in its solar system, out where you know Uranus and Neptune are in our solar system. And it's as far towards the center of our galaxy as you can get. So this is the closest I could get to Vormir, is this ogle, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, they have terrible names. Okay. Now we're going to move into some things that weren't predicted by sci-fi. As you can see, people have done an incredibly good job with their imaginations of building fantastic, crazy worlds that we've been able to go out and find. But actually, a running theme in science is that nature is almost always more imaginative than we are. So I want to talk through a couple of systems that we found that are just cool and don't actually show up quite so much in science, uh, in science fiction. This is a system, this is a graphic of a system called TRAPPIST-1. So TRAPPIST-1, this star is another one of these M dwarfs, a little, little red star. And in fact, TRAPPIST-1 is just about as small as you can be and still call yourself a star. Like on the playground, this is the thing out there getting bullied by everyone else because it's 8% the mass of the sun. It's very small. But what it lacks in size, it really makes up for in planets. It has seven rocky planets all that all orbit within a period of 42 days so in our solar system mercury which is the closest planet to our sun has a period of like 87 days this is seven planets inside the period of mercury this is super compact and super packed in and it's this new type of system that we found with with many small planets all packed in as tightly as you could be packed in basically if you tried to put another planet in here it would go dynamically unstable and everything would scatter out like these systems that we find that are compact and very and very packed with planets uh we call them dynamically packed because you just couldn't fit any more in there uh and it's this really cool new mystery like how do they form you know we have this theory for how our solar system forms which is actually quite violent it involves lots of things bashing and interacting with each other and kicking around and maybe jupiter and saturn switched places at one point uh but that can't have happened here you can't have a really violent beginning and then end up with this beautifully ordered set of planets that are packed in very tightly um so it's fantastic for theorists because they're like oh yay something new to explain uh one of my favorite examples of this system uh, was actually found by citizen scientists, by people like you at home on their computers looking through Kepler data. And it's called K2138. It has five planets. Now it has six planets, but we haven't published the sixth one yet. It has five planets uh, and they're all in this compact configuration. They're all really packed in again. This one, the, the furthest out one that, that has been published has a period of 12 days. This is five planets with periods out to 12 days. And that's super cool. It's so tight. One of the ways these systems are stable is because they're in resonance with each other. What that means is that their periods are related by integer numbers uh, and they're in clock. It's like a clockwork. Uh, and we see some of those in our solar system. So the Galilean moons are, are in these resonances. The three of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter are in resonance. Uh, and actually Neptune and Pluto were in a three to two resonance. So these planets are all in resonance around the star and they're all in a chain of three to two resonances. That means the innermost planet goes around three times for every two times the next one goes around. It goes around three times for every two times the next one goes around and vice versa, all the way out. Uh, at, they're all three to two. The very cool thing about the three to two resonances, if you like music, the three to two resonance is the perfect fifth interval. It's, the, it's in the tonic chord in Western music theory. Three, three to two is the perfect fifth interval. The perfect fifth interval is the first two notes of Twinkle Twinkle. So you can actually turn this system into music. 
So I'm going to start playing this video. This was made by Matt Russo up in Toronto. Every time a planet passes in front of the star, it plays a note. And the higher the note, the faster the planet is moving. And the thing is, because they're all in resonance, it actually sounds beautiful. This is just your moment of zen in the middle of a pretty energetic talk. They're all three to two resonances. All right, I'll turn that down. You too can go and find planets. So as I said, this was actually found by citizen scientists. So if you go to planethunters.org, we don't have Kepler data anymore. Now we have NASA's latest mission called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. There is tons of test data there just waiting for people to find planets in. So you could be going and finding your own planet that I would be presenting in the next talk. Uh, so everybody's locked at home with the pandemic. Try your hands at citizen science. It's a real great way to contribute to a lot of amazing projects. Uh, so this is Tess, actually, as I mentioned. Uh, oh, I set Peter up wrong. I'm not ending on a Roman slide. I'm ending on a Tess slide. So Tess is exciting because it's doing an entire all sky survey. So where I said, remember, Kepler did like one patch of sky. Tess is doing the whole sky. And Tess is predicted to find something like 10 to 15,000 planets. So remember, I said near the start, we found 4,000 planets now. Tess over the next few years is supposed to basically quintuple that. We'll have 20,000 planets that we know. And all I can think is that we're going to keep finding the most amazing things. We're going to keep finding your favorite science fiction planets. We're going to find things we never even imagined. We're going to find things that we've never seen before. And that's all going to be incredibly cool. So I can't wait until the next time I'm giving you guys a talk and telling you about all the latest, very, very cool things that we found. So thank you so much for having me come and give the talk tonight. Let's give some virtual claps for our speaker. There's the reaction button and you can put some claps there next to your next to your picture. Thank you, Dr. Christensen. That's a wonderful talk. I'd like to let everyone know if you have some questions, uh, please post them in the chat. We actually have some good news. The humidity has not risen as rapidly as was forecast. And so currently it's safe enough to open a telescope. And there are some actual planets so up in the sky. Tonight. Yes, yes, just just the orbit of our sun. We're not gonna be looking at the, the planets around other suns tonight. That's a, that's a wonderful talk. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the questions. Um, our first question comes from um, Umran, uh, Umran K. What do you think about the Fermi paradox? Oh, that's a really good question. So for the people in the audience who don't know, the Fermi paradox is basically, there are billions of stars in the galaxy that are billions of years older than our sun. If there was even a small chance of intelligent life evolving in more than one place, we should see it everywhere. There's just been billions and billions of chances for it to happen. Uh, and if it evolves in the same way we have and begins to explore in the same way we hope to, that we're starting to do just even in our solar system, why don't we see it everywhere? Like life should be everywhere if it arises more than once. Um, and that's a really good question. So I would say that on Earth, what we see is that almost as soon as Earth was able to host simple single-celled life, like within 100 million years of the surface of the earth cooling down enough to hope to have liquid water, we see evidence of simple life emerge. And, you know, 100 million years or less is a blink in astronomical time. That's so fast. And then it's billions of years before complicated multi-celled life appears. So there's billions of years of our earth just hanging out with simple single-celled things just like crawling around like, cool, I'm just going to make some oxygen. It's great. And then we see multi-celled life. So it might be, it might be that simple life is easy to make and that the galaxy is full of amoebas hanging out, making oxygen. And it could be that multi-celled life is hard to make. That's a lot of heavy lifting from a sample size of one. Uh, it's hard to know. Basically something must stop life from exploring the galaxy. And it could just be that it's physics. 
it could just be that the laws of physics mean that it's really hard to explore the galaxies in terms of energy to get places and time to get places. But there have been billions of years. So even if you did it really slow, hence the paradox. So that's my, I don't have an answer because it's paradox, but that's what I think. Yeah, one of my favorite science fiction novel series of recent times I've had time to read since I got my PhD is the Alistair Reynolds Revelation Space series. I don't know if you've heard of that. I, I've heard of the author, but I haven't read it. Yeah, so it, it's, it's a, it, it talks about the Fermi paradox and, and the premise is that there's this kind of barrier to preventing- Yeah, the, the great filter. The great filter. And, and mm -hmm. that's a question humanity always asks is, I would pass the great filter or not if there is a great filter uh and meaning that um are we all, all clear to go explore in a galaxy or is there some other calamity in humanity's future future such as climate change or yeah something that will, will uh, ultimately doom our species and in the the revelation space science fiction novels it's a some advanced intelligent civilization out there that just destroys all of their life that it encounters uh, yeah like, so w which side of the great filter we're on is one of the unanswered questions yeah um there's also shishin lu has this amazing trilogy the three body problem is the first book and they talk about that the solution to the fermi paradox is basically everybody gets smart enough to realize that if you make yourself known someone will come and take you out so everybody they, it's the dark forest everybody's just like quietly like no one notices we're just gonna hang here it's okay um, so that's one theory. Maybe everybody's just hunkering down because they're afraid of everyone else. Who knows? And it's always fun to wonder about those things. Yeah. So our next, our next question comes from Nicholas. Uh, do planets, oh, I like this question. Do planets always orbit stars? Can, and, there, and there's free floating planets that we can talk about too in a related question. But can a small star be in orbit around a large planet? Ah, so actually we've just found something like that. Um, so stars like our sun, at the very ends of their lives, so the sun will expand in 5 billion years and come, be, you know, grow to the size where it basically engulfs Mercury, Venus and, and the Earth, basically. Uh, and then when it runs out of fuel, it's going to puff off all those outer layers and hopefully become a beautiful planetary nebula for other people to look at. Uh, and the center is just going to collapse down to this little ball of carbon and oxygen called a white dwarf, which will then radiate energy and just cool off forever. But they're very small. They're actually, you know, you know, the size of the Earth, even very small. And we've actually just found one recently that was orbited, that's orbited by a gas giant. So it's a Jupiter-sized planet orbiting an Earth-sized star. Um, the Earth-sized star still has more mass in it than the gas giant does. So the true Barry center, the true like gravitational center of the two things that the bodies are orbiting around uh, isn't in the planet. So it's not the fact, it's not that the small star is orbiting the planet, but both the small star and the large planet are orbiting their center of gravity. Um, and yeah, then like, free like floating planets. Question. I like that question because you have, oh, sorry, interrupted, but I like that okay. question uh, about the bodies because we don't actually orbit our sun, right? We orbit the center of mass, but it just so happens that the sun has most of the mass in our solar system. Go ahead, Jesse. Oh, and I was You're saying free floating planets. We have actually found planets that don't seem to be attached to any star. Um, and there's a few theories about that. Uh, one is that they formed in a solar system like our solar system. And, you know, as I said, we think that there's some violent rearrangement happening in our early solar system to get to the configuration we see today. And it's possible that those kinds of violent interactions have ejected large planets from the solar system uh, or other systems, and they just go sailing through space. They're unhinged from their star and they just get to go. Uh, another theory is that stars and stellar systems form from collapsing clouds of gas. And it could just be that there was a little baby cloud of gas that was like, Boop, and it wasn't quite big enough to make a star. So it made a big planet instead. And then you end up with just a free floating planet that doesn't have a star. Great. Uh, so our next question was asked during your talk. So I'm not entirely sure of the context. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a related question, a sec two, two questions that I'm still trying to figure out. One, did they go around a black hole? So maybe just to reinterpret that question, have we ever found planets that orbit black holes? Uh, and a related question was asked, uh, how far are, are these planets that we're talking about from the Earth, say? Yeah. So they might have been talking about Doctor Who because there is an episode in Doctor Who where they're near a black hole. Um, it's a very cool episode, actually. Um, we have not found planets around black holes yet. Um, so when I said that, you know, at the end of our sun's lifetime, it'll become a white dwarf. 
at the end of much larger stars' lifetimes, they'll shed their outer layers in a much more violent explosion and they'll collapse down into a black hole. Now, the thing is, it's really hard to see black holes because they don't really emit any light. Um, and all of the ways that we detect planets so far, except for direct imaging, rely on actually looking at the star and seeing how the planet changes the star. So things like the wobble method that I talked about, you're watching the star move because it's getting tugged by the planet. The way that Kepler telescope works is via the transit method. So we actually just watch the stars and if the planet's lined up just right, it'll block some of the light. So we just measure the light over and over again and wait for these dips. So almost all of the ways we have of detecting planets actually rely on light from the star. So the fact that black holes don't emit any light makes it hard to find planets around black holes. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't think they exist, especially now that we found these planets around white dwarfs. Um, so we know that there is either some way for planets to survive these quite violent happenings in the evolution of their star, or that there's some kind of second generation of planets, like the star goes boom, explodes all the planets into dust and gas, and then they reform into a second generation of planets. That then, that's, a, that's what we're finding. So I, I'd say we're all fairly confident that there are planets around, brown, uh, around black dwarfs, around black holes. Um, but we haven't seen them yet because it's hard enough to find them around real stars that put out lots of light. Cool. Uh, so yeah, we had a comment during that title, we locked planets are so cool from, from James White. Uh, do you know, I also asked this question, which system would you most like to see explored in science fiction from the Twitter user in the unfortunate time zone? Oh, I'm sorry about the time zone issue. That stupid round planet. Uh, it's very frustrating. Um, that's a good question. So maybe one of these really compact systems, because one of the things I like to think about with these compact systems, think about how big the moon is in our sky, right? It's pretty big. Now imagine if the moon was replaced with something like a bigger planet, like an, an Earth-sized planet. There's a possibility that life on one planet would actually be able to detect life on the other planet, on the night side of that planet, like city lights or something, before you'd even explored your own planet. Like you'd just be able to look up in the sky at night and, you know, especially if the life on the next planet arose early. It's just such a cool idea that you'd be able to look up and see lights, like see a city on another planet because it's so big in your sky because these systems are so compact that the planets are really big in each other's skies. So visually, I think that would be really cool. Uh, and, you know, we kind of get close to that in the expanse. So the expanse is based in the solar system, but it's a solar system 200 years in the future where you know, a lot of planets are now uh, explored and, and terraformed and have inhabitable like the moon and Mars and a bunch of stuff in the asteroid belt. Um, but yeah, so the, uh, that's that same kind of visual is there where you can look up and see the moon is actually covered in civilization. So that would be cool to see that explored more in science fiction in an exoplanet system. Trappist-1 for instance, or K2-138, but I'm biased because that's the one I got to publish. Yeah, uh, so, um... Our, this question comes from Bruce. Are we also looking for exo-dwarf planets? Uh, you mean like Pluto? That's a good question. So we're looking for anything we can find. Um, because of the way our sensitivities work, it's very hard to find small planets. The smaller the planet is, the harder it is to find because it pulls less on the star and it blocks less of the star's light. It's really hard to find small planets. And in fact, one of the things Peter's been working on is how to push the radial velocity technique down to being able to detect these small planets. Um, the smallest planets we found, we have found like Mercury sized planets, um, one, using, uh, one using Kepler and some using a pulsar timing technique. So pulsars are another like end stage of a different size star's life that emit pulses on thousands of times a second. And then if you time those pulses, you can see that the star is coming towards you and away from you. It's just like another way of doing the wobble method. Um, so we have found Mercury sized things, but that's as small as we've gotten. We haven't gotten all the way down to Pluto. That's not to say we're not looking for them, just that they're really hard to find. Yeah, there have been some uh, transiting exo asteroids, I think, right? Orbiting white dwarfs. Oh, stuff. yeah, some like a, uh, yeah, exo comets. We're, kind of that, we're still working that one out. Yeah. Um, so uh, a question from Amish, uh, what do you think about time dilation? Uh, as a physics concept? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, it's kind of neat. Uh, there've been cool experiments on earth that show that it works. Like if you send a stopwatch up in a spacecraft and then let it rotate around the earth at you know, pretty fast speed and then bring it back down, you can see that the stopwatch that you started on earth and the stop stopwatch that went to space aren't the same anymore. Um, so I believe in it. 
if that's the question. I think it's cool. Fair. Um, yeah. And then uh, um, next question. Uh, could a tidally locked planet, this comes from Britt Adkins, still be habitable on one side as in the trapeze uh, system that you discussed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of the trapeze systems, uh, a lot of the trapeze planets are probably tidally locked. So this is for, for the rest of you, the same way the moon is tidally locked to us, always shows its same face. If planets are too close to their star, they'll also be tidally locked. They'll basically just show one face to the star. So they've got a permanent day side and a permanent night side. Now, if either of those day side or night side are the right temperature or even the terminator, the ring between day and night, like where it's permanently dusk is the right temperature, then they all have habitability prospects that, that you know, you could be permanently day and could be permanently night. And in another one of those fun thought exercises, I always thought it would be funny if you were an intelligent civilization that had evolved on a tidally locked planet and you were looking at something like the earth where the period of the rotation was completely decoupled from the year and it was like day night day night day night uh i i feel like that life would be looking at us and being like how does that life work it's the temperature swings all the time like there's no constant radiation um so i actually think we probably have the less habitable situation uh than tidally locked planets but that's pure speculation and just a fun thought exercise on my part yeah, I've never thought about that. That's a great thought experiment. So we've got one more question, and we're going to start sharing uh, our view of our um, virtual view of our observatory uh, as we take this last question um, from Bruce. How well are we able to tell the elements of the systems? Like, would we be able to tell, uh, would we be able to find, say, a giant gold nugget of an exoplanet? Oh, yeah. Okay, so there's a few different ways we can work out what planets are made of. With the transit method, which gives you the size of the planet, and the radial velocity method, which gives you the mass of a planet, you can get an idea of the average composition. Like if it's made of pure iron, then it, then you would know that the only thing that could make that density is pure iron. But if it's made of pure, if it's very, very light and fluffy, then you know it's pure gas like hydrogen and helium. So you can get a pretty good guess of the sort of class of planet that it is just from its bulk density except for super Earths and mini Neptunes, which we're still working out because we don't have anything like that. And we're trying to work out what they're made of. Now, in terms of actually detecting elements, the way we do that is by looking at planets' atmospheres. So we, uh, there's a few different ways we do that, but basically you want to look at the atmosphere as a function of wavelength, look in different colors of light and see where the colors are blocked. Different molecules block different colors of light. So water blocks a specific color of light. Uh, so if you look in all these different colors and you see that the color of light that's blocked is, but is the same wavelength as water, then you can go, ah, there's water in this atmosphere because it's blocking the light. Um, gold would be tricky because gold's not typically just up in the atmosphere, unfortunately. Uh, it's pretty heavy. Uh, so we might have to wait a bit for that. I'm trying to imagine a thought experiment. If there was a planet that was like a huge chunk of gold, it would, have very, it would have very specific reflectance properties, like the way it reflected light would happen very particularly. So maybe if you had something like uh, a direct imaging telescope. So direct imaging, I didn't really talk about, but that's where you use a very clever instrument to block out the star. And then you look, around, look very carefully around where that star is blocked out for planets. So if you could see it in direct imaging, you might be able to do that as a function of wavelength and be like, okay, that's gold. It's, it's hard to come up with a scenario where in an early solar system, you have enough gold and it's all close enough together to just make a gold planet, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Fair. You know, I think one of the interesting things from Kepler and Tess has been that we didn't really find any like pure iron planets, like super, super dense planets. Yeah. Um, it's hard to make, apparently it's hard to make a planet much, much, much more dense than, than the earth. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's really just how all of those elements were spread around in the early solar system. I mean, it's just hard to collect a bunch of iron together and not also collect a bunch of carbon and silicon and nitrogen and stuff. So we have one more question in the chat and uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Christensen to join us. If you want to check out that question in the uh, chat before the humidity gets too high, we're going to turn things over to our student tour guides to give you a virtual tour of the night sky and apparently a spider web in front of one of our webcams. Uh, so go ahead, students, uh, feel free to introduce yourselves and take over. Once again, let's give a virtual applause for Dr. Christensen's talk. Thank you so much for joining us tonight all the way from Caltech. And uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Peter. And thank you, Dr. Christensen. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk and I hope everyone else did too. Uh, I think uh, judging by the uh, uh, chat box, I think that's uh, true. So 
We're going to go ahead and uh, transition to the virtual tour part of the evening. So the planets uh, we were going to show you are uh, setting. So I'm going to try and go a little quickly uh, in the beginning just so we can get on to the observing. So right now we are connected to one of the computers uh, at uh, on top of Research Hall at the observatory. And one of the great things we have uh, is a set of webcams that make it so we can see what we're actually doing at the observatory. So uh, in the top right, we have a view of the control room. We are currently connected to the computer that's uh, on the middle left. Then we have a clone of that computer. In theory, it's a clone uh, towards uh, the bottom left. And we do all of our software testing and whatnot on that. But we primarily control uh, everything uh, on the telescope through that uh, this one computer here. So uh, if we are here in person, uh, we usually spend, uh, or observers will spend uh, pretty much the whole night in this one cramped room uh, chilling out. But uh, thankfully, uh, we can observe uh, remotely within the comfort of our own homes during this pandemic. So in the bottom right, uh, we have no signal. That camera is in a box, so we aren't really expecting anything. And in the bottom left, we have an outside view of the dome. So we can see that the shutter is open with the telescope uh, peeking out of the shutter right there. And we are greeted with a beautiful uh, spider, spider web that's uh, right smack in the middle of our view. So that's wonderful. And uh, for reference, uh, in case you want to get a sense of scale, the door is about six and a half feet high. So you can kind of get a sense of scale uh, with that. And then last but certainly not least, in the top left, we have the actual telescope that we'll be looking through. So uh, Patrick, could you please uh, tell us a little bit about this telescope? Well, I think um, I was supposed to go over the telescope. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Ashley. It's OK. It's totally fine. Um, this, so I'm Ashley. I'm a senior here at George Mason. And um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about our telescope. Um, it is a reflecting telescope as opposed to a refracting telescope. So that means we use mirrors instead of um, lenses. And that usually gives us a better picture of what we want to look at. Um, let me see if I can share my cursor. Uh, you can see uh, a very good view of our telescope right now. Our primary mirror in the back here is uh, 32 inches or 0 0.8 meters in diameter. And then we our secondary mirror up here is about a foot in diameter. And um, just to kind of give you a sense of how light travels in our telescope, uh, light comes in, uh, bounces off the secondary mirror, hits the primary mirror and bounces back down to that little porthole where, um, where it's picked up by all of our instruments like our CCD camera, our eyepiece, and um, that's where we view our images. So yeah, um, you have any questions about the telescope, you can leave them in the chat. But uh, as um, William said, we're trying to get you guys to see some uh, planets. So let's see if we can get a good view of Saturn real quick before it sets. <laughs> so I'm going to show you. So this program here is called SkyX. Uh, our telescope is connected to this program. And what happens is there it is. See the telescope moving. So the SkyX programs allows, program allows us to move the telescope uh, to it to a desired location, and we can actually track that object through the night uh, as it goes across the sky. Uh, you can see the telescope moving here. You can see all the um, how big it is in, in comparison to the dome. Uh, you can kind of see some parts moving in here. Just kind of shows you how the um, how the uh, support moves and uh, adjust the telescope. So just to give you guys a little bit more idea, uh, SkyX, uh, it's a, actually a view of the night sky as it would appear in if we were actually there looking up at the sky. And it looks like we're just getting onto Saturn. All right. And we are just about good. Let's see. Now our dome has to catch up to the telescope, which it should very shortly start moving so that the telescope can see out of the dome. Yep, there it is. There it goes moving. And you can actually kind of watch it move away from the camera up here. 
and it's almost there. And I'm going to open our imaging software while it's moving. Uh, everything looks to be set up just about right. And oops. All right, looks like we're there. You can actually see the tops of trees through the uh, camera, which is pretty cool. Let's double check and we are good to go. All right, so let's take our first image of the night. So we are going to use, so our uh, CCD camera is attached to the other end of the telescope through that porthole I was showing you. And it can be, it can be used to take pictures in any of these filters. We are going to do H alpha, which is a really alpha. red filter. And we're going to do 0.5 seconds and see if, what that gets us. And start. We're gonna see if we can get a good image of Saturn off of this. And right now it's just collecting light from the whatever from Saturn and whatever it's looking at in the sky and it's gonna come up with an image. Now we have to adjust it so that we can see just exactly what we're looking for. There is Saturn. And it looks kind of like an oval, <laughs> but that's because Saturn gives off a whole lot of light. So we kind of have to adjust what we're looking at to really get those features that we know Saturn, it's really pop. So, and you might notice that you don't see any stars in the image. That's actually because uh, we have to block out enough light to actually, oh, well, there's a few. Those actually might be some of Saturn's moons. Um, we have to block out enough light to get a good view of Saturn. All right, so it's a little bit out of focus, but that's okay. For our purposes, that is Saturn there. Play around with this, um, with the light a little bit, see if we can really, yeah, I think that's good. All right, so that is Saturn through our telescope. Um, our CCD has a very large pixel array, so it takes um, a big view of the um, night sky and um, so Saturn looks very small in comparison to the big field of view it's the CCD has. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Saturn. I'll keep it brief. Uh, Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun. Um, it's a gas giant and it's actually uh, made mostly of hydrogen and helium. So uh, not quite as exciting to probably um, live on as some of the planets we discussed in the um, in the uh, presentation, which was really cool to listen to. Uh, but Saturn does have, along with the, a really cool ring system it has, it does actually have two moons that could be potential uh, places of life and actually do sound like they come out of sci-fi. Um, Titan is one of Saturn's um, large, actually it is Saturn's largest moon. And it actually has a substantial atmosphere of nitrogen and um, which is very similar to our uh, our atmosphere here on Earth, and um, it doesn't have uh, an oxygen content, as high an oxygen content, but it is mostly made of nitrogen. It also has rivers, lakes, and seas of methane, uh, which makes Titan a really unique uh, moon in our solar system. And then the other one is Enceladus, which is actually an ice giant. Um, well, not an ice giant. It's an ice, um, ice moon. It's covered in a sheet of ice, and there's believed to be a subsurface ocean beneath. So that is Saturn and its, and its moons. If you have any questions, please uh, drop it in the chat and we'll see what we can answer. I think I'm gonna hand it over to um, Owen, who's going to talk about Andromeda Galaxy. Before Hello. we move on, oh. sorry, sorry, Owen. Uh, before we move on to Andromeda, Andromeda is much higher in the sky and the moon is setting. Uh, I think it would be better if we tried to get the moon right quick before it gets too low. So uh, Patrick, could you, you said you were doing the moon, right? Yeah, if you could uh, take us to the moon and uh, we can see what that looks like.
So one thing uh, you've probably noticed uh, is uh, if you've seen Saturn through an eyepiece, uh, you might notice that uh, Saturn's uh, a little bit more detailed uh, in an eyepiece. And uh, the same is uh, true for our telescope. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter both look significantly better through our eyepiece uh, compared to the CCD. So the main reason for that is the exposure time of the CCD, uh, just no matter how low we want to set it, we're just taking in uh, way too much light and we're uh, just uh, saturating a lot of the details just because the planets are very bright and we have a reasonably large telescope. So believe it or not, this telescope is actually a little bit too big to be taking very uh, detailed high res uh, images of the planets. Okay, so here we've got an uh, image of the moon uh, right along the Terminator, where you can see a relatively large amount of detail in terms of craters and mountains. In uh, general, the, that's where you can see the most detail. And so even though in principle you can see more of the moon when it's, say, full, right now where it's a crescent uh, that shows uh, more of any given one region. Go over a little bit more about the moon's features. It is the only uh, satellite, the only natural satellite of the Earth. It's relatively large as far as moons go, being about uh, you know, a quarter the size of Earth uh, in terms of radius, and then about 181st the mass of uh, Earth. That. Uh, Part of the reason for that discrepancy is that uh, the moon's also a little bit lower density. Uh, let's see. Unfortunately, we can't like uh, show you any detailed images of, say, an Apollo landing site or uh, the spacecraft that are currently in orbit around the moon, like uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, because uh, ultimately that would require a telescope at a distance that's about uh, 40 to 100 meters across. Okay, wonderful, Patrick. Thank you. Um, do we want to uh, take uh, another exposure right quick in a different filter, uh, perhaps a UV, just to see what uh, tossing a different filter on uh, looks like? So we might be able to see uh, slightly different. Uh, you might have noticed that all of these images are in black and white, and uh, that's expected uh, regardless of the filter we have. The CCD will just pick up the uh, intensity of the photons that are coming off the uh, object. It doesn't really know how to map things from, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't know how to distinguish colors. So to make colored images, what we actually do is take these uh, black and white images in multiple filters, and then we can stack them on top of each other and using various processing software, we can get a colored image. Would have been helpful if we had uh, the H alpha and the UV side by side so we could see if there were actually any differences. Uh, but anyways, uh, this is what it looks like in the UV. So yeah, I think there's some differences, but uh, I'm not going to uh, bet any money on what ones specifically there are. Yeah, neither would I. Uh, so anyways, uh, this is the moon. And what we can do now is uh, we can have Owen uh, discuss uh, a little bit about the Andromeda galaxy for us. Hello. Um, I guess let's 
first of all, slew to the Andromeda Galaxy. Which is there it is. Uh-oh. M31, as it's known. Got to zoom all the way out before you can find it on the software. There it is. While we're slewing, let's give a little backstory to the Andromeda Galaxy. So it was first discovered in the year 964 by a Persian astronomer. Um, and they didn't know what galaxies were at the time. So he called it like a nebula sort of thing. Um, but then later on, I think it was Hubble that figured out that it was actually a galaxy super far away. Um, so it's about, how far away? It's about two and a half million light years uh, from Earth. So just for a little perspective, our nearest star is only about four and a half light years away. So it's very, very far away. Um, it's actually going to collide with our galaxy, the Milky Way, in four and a half billion years um, and to form one conglomerate galaxy, but we'll probably be long gone by then, so we don't have to worry about it. Oh, and uh, when the galaxies collide, do you know if any of the actual stars in each of the galaxies are going to smack into each other? Uh, no, I don't believe they are, because everything, the distance between all the stars are so great that there's a very little chance that any will actually collide. Right, right, exactly. Come on, so in the bottom left of a uh, team of the uh, camera, uh, of the webcam, see we can see the dome rotating, and on the inside, uh, too, where we're looking at the telescope, we can see that spinning in the background, which is pretty interesting. And if we were there in person, we would actually hear the dome making a very uh, distinct uh, sound. Uh, I like to describe it as a uh, spaceship uh, getting ready to go into warp speed uh, in some cheesy science fiction movie. And apparently I'm the only one who describes it like that. So uh, <laughs> maybe it's not the best description, but that's what it sounds like to me. So. So Amish asked a good question. So uh, when the. Uh, Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda galaxy collide, uh, will they just turn into a single big galaxy, no explosions? Uh, to answer the question about single big galaxy, as Justin uh, said in chat, yes, uh, it'll likely just turn into one big elliptical galaxy. And that's actually how we think uh, most elliptical galaxies have formed. Uh, two younger uh, spiral galaxies have merged together and formed this one big elliptical galaxy. So by and large, uh, in, in general, uh, elliptical galaxies are the uh, biggest uh, galaxies in the universe. You know, you can find spirals that are bigger than ellipticals, but uh, certainly I think the largest galaxy, uh, known galaxy in the universe is an elliptical. Uh, you will notice that we have taken a much longer exposure than we did to look at the moon or Saturn. And even though Andromeda is relatively bright in the sky, it's much, much more dim than the planets are. We 
we got to play with the screen stretch a bit. So it's kind of faint, but you can you can see where the center of the galaxy is quite well, where there's just a whole bunch of uh, stars. Um, there, the um, the lines along the each of the stars are from either a deck oscillation where it's um, our telescope sometimes has a, this little problem where it wobbles in one direction or we started the exposure while the telescope was slewing. Yeah, it's not particularly wobbly. I think uh, it just uh, streaked a little bit. Uh, we started the exposure a little uh, too early. We can uh, go ahead and take uh, another 60 second exposure. And one thing uh, you're bound to notice uh, that's uh, dotting this image all around are these little uh, things that look like donuts. Uh, they have a, a darker center and then they're surrounded by this uh, lighter uh, donut-like exterior. And uh, we have no idea what those could be. They are a relatively uh, new phenomena and they're not the usual um, dust uh, donuts that we usually uh, get, I believe. So we can, yeah, we're not entirely sure what's causing those guys. Um, but anyways, uh, we should be, are we taking a new exposure? Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. Okay. There it is, uh, much cleaner. Let's zoom out just a bit. And the stars that you're seeing sort of in front of in front of Andromeda are stars in the foreground. So the stars actually in Andromeda are so far away that they're just some light at this point. think if you squint you can see some dark banding just very I don't know if we want to take a longer exposure we might be able to see it better or in a different filter um, Okay, Owen, thank you yeah. for that. Uh, is there anything else you want to uh, add? No, just wait for this exposure. Okay, yeah, yeah, we can try a longer exposure. So this will probably uh, blow out the core of the galaxy, but we might be able to make out some of the detail in the spiral arms of Andromeda. So uh, taking uh, 
exposures where you have a really bright uh, central source and then fainter uh, things uh, nearby is very difficult because you can't really get both of them in one shot. You need to use a very short exposure time to get the uh, bright central object, then you're not going to see uh, the details uh, and the fainter surrounding stuff. And then to uh, bring out the details in the uh, uh, in the fainter objects, you need to do the opposite. You need to crank up the exposure time, but then you're really going to saturate your uh, bright core. So it's a, it's a trade-off. And uh, when you go and uh, make a final image, you can do some fancy editing and uh, make something that looks uh, you know more in proportion. The humidity is also quite high tonight, so I'm sure the viewing conditions, you know, through the atmosphere are not very optimal either. But nonetheless, uh, it's good uh, we're actually getting to see things. Uh, a lot of our uh, Evening Under the Stars events have been a closed dome, which is uh, unfortunate because then we just uh, have to show you pictures we've taken beforehand, which isn't as nearly as exciting. Yeah. Oops. Wait, that's yes, I believe the Novak events are shifted uh, to online. Well, yes, the, the center did get quite blown out. You can see the spiral banding um, much better. Yeah. Right, so as Owen uh, pointed out, uh, we have these uh, dark kind of lanes uh, or dust lanes as they're called and you know as the name implies that's actually caused by dust in the spiral arms of the Andromeda galaxy that is blocking light from reaching us. In fact if you go to a uh, dark sky site and you uh, take a look at the Milky Way band across the sky uh, you can actually see uh, similar kinds of dust lanes. Uh, you'll see uh, the bright band of the Milky Way, but embedded within that band are a bunch of random dark patches. And for a long time, uh, you know, way back when people, you know, were studying, uh, were didn't know a whole lot about astronomy, uh, they wondered uh, whether uh, there were just not a lot of stars there in that region or if something else was happening. And it turns out that uh, looking at the, uh, the, those dark splotches uh, in the band of the Milky Way is uh, one of the best uh, clues that there is dust uh, out in the universe that is interfering with the observations that we make. So that's uh, a very uh, neat uh, naked eye observation that you can do that uh, really tells you a lot about uh, about the uh, nature of the universe. You have lots of uh, dust uh, strewn throughout that uh, reddens uh, the light that reaches us. Uh, but anyways, uh, all the we were only planning on showing you uh, three objects. So the moon, uh, Saturn, and Andromeda. Uh, we were uh, kind of in a little bit of a rush because of the presidential debates uh, and we didn't want to uh, you know, take up too much of that, but uh, Personally, I wouldn't mind uh, doing a different, uh, uh, an additional object or two if there's interest for that, uh, as long as the tour guides uh, don't mind uh, sticking around. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I would say that uh, with this, uh, with this last image of Andromeda, I would say that, you know, formally uh, would conclude the Evening Under the Stars event for tonight. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you do have any uh, questions lingering, please feel free to put them in the chat. And uh, Ben, Andromeda is a galaxy. So, all right. Well, yeah, I think uh, we're going to 
Yeah, I think we might as well go ahead and wrap it up. So uh, if you want to come back uh, another night, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, we, we hold these uh, every two weeks. You can find more information on our website, science.gmu.edu slash observatory, or you can just Google GMU Observatory website and look for the Google site. So thank you all for uh, coming out. Um, really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, there was a feedback form uh, posted in the chat a little while ago by Peter. If you could fill that out, uh, that would be uh, appreciated. We like to know how we're doing and your suggestions and feedback are welcome. But anyways, uh, thank you all uh, and uh, have a great weekend. <laughs>